understanding initially. So these are very important. Um, before we go into that, does anybody have any questions for functions earlier that we had uh, that Shrinjoy has got and we may have any doubts about functions? Functions, anyone? No doubts? Everybody's clear about all about argument passing and multiple arguments and... I think, uh, no, but I think I just need to like practice some more on my own to get a better sense of it before I can ask higher level questions. All right. So you're just being honest, that's good. <laughs> it's like, no, it's, but it's not your fault. <laughs> that I don't understand this. Okay, what just happened? All right. Um, so, we'll quickly brush through this. Um, so, you had uh, control structures covered. Let's see if I can do a screencast of this. screen and not this one. Um, okay, so you, we went over control structures. You guys should know these by now. Um, there's the if structure, the, you know, and then there's the, um, the simple, this is if, if condition, true or false evaluation, then you assign y to one thing, otherwise you assign to something else. That's the else part is the otherwise part of the statement. Uh, and so, so is the, the, this is also a, a valid structure where you're taking the if statement and then assigning that output to y by the assignment, explicit assignment statement like this, where this whole thing is evaluated and then the result is given to y, which is the same as that, all right? Uh, so, um, of course, the else clause is unnecessary. If you just have one part, then you just have the if. Uh, this is a for loop where you have a variable that iterates. This is the iterator. It goes from 1 to 10. Um, the whole point is, based on that iterator, you can do stuff. For example, you can just print the value of i, or you can go ahead and do some other stuff uh, in it. Um, you can also, the iterators can be uh, elements of a vector. So, or you want to just take the vector, uh, which has four elements, and take the, the position of that and print them out in serial order. Um, that's, uh, you can nest for loops. Nesting is a concept that we'll cover in functions as well. But it's an important thing to understand that, uh, does everybody understand nesting? So nesting is a concept where you call the same thing within itself. So the same thing is, uh, um, in this, for example, you, the way you go about evaluating a nested function is that you first take one uh, the outer loop and then you realize that, that, wait a second, inside that there's another loop, so let's start with the innermost statement, so that's saying print xij, uh, so then you're like, okay, so what is j is the innermost variable, so you see that j goes from uh, 1 to some value, which is the number of columns of x, and then, okay, <coughs> then what is i, i is the second one, so you start printing, which goes from the number of rows of x, which x is a matrix, so Basically, it, it, it'll, uh, you know, so then you iterate and print the value of xij. So you're essentially printing the matrix like that. But the, the nesting part is there's first a for loop outside, and then there's another for loop inside. Similarly for functions, um, you know, nested functions is when you have a function within another function. So that's called nesting, right? Um, the only way to understand this more would be to execute this, you know, and see. You can also print the value of i, print the value of j here apart from the statement that way you know what the iterators are it gives you a better sense of how the computer itself is is going ahead and printing uh, uh, processing this statement all right so if you print out i uh, and j you'll realize that the first uh, in the first uh, step 
you will have the same value for i and then j will change three times or four times, whatever the count of j is, the number of elements where j goes from. And then, then the value of i will change from one to two and then again it will print out all the j's that the j uh, value goes from. So uh, I, I would suggest doing that to understand this more. Uh, while loop is another form of loop, like for loop you have count less than 10, uh, so it just increments the count, and you and, and you, uh, you know, the the statement the check is here, and this is the uh, statement that are executed if this check is still true. So while this check is true, it'll continue to execute whatever's in within the brackets. If you want an infinite loop, you just put while true, and it'll go on forever. Is that clear? Make sense? This is more like a fast forward rapid fire round, so. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is an example. Sometimes there'll be more than one condition to test, so you can use the double ampersand is the way to express the and uh, condition. So you want to be like, if this is true and this is true, then go ahead and do. Uh, similarly, you can also have or in here, which is two uh, uh, lines. Uh, the, you know, the more lines, the pipe, the pipes on your keyboard. Those, if you put two of them, that's or. So you could be like, if this is true or this another condition is true, either one of them is true, then do something. You can do that. Um, so practice these; they're important stuff. You, most of the times, you'll be using these loops to get your stuff done. So this is very important. Repeat is a similar thing, except in that you keep doing something until a condition holds true. Um, so. Uh, repeat initiates an infinite loop in this case. These are not commonly used in statistical applications, but they have their uses. Uh, in R, the only way to exit a repeat loop is to call the break statement. So when you call break, it'll break out of the loop. Otherwise, it'll continue to keep executing the loop. OK, uh, functions. We covered this uh, last time. Functions are starting by the name function as a directive to R. Uh, they're stored like any other R object. In, um, so it's a, uh, they're of the class function itself is a class. Uh, so f here is being assigned to a function with the keyword function. It's important that you use the keyword function. And then you pass a list of arguments. So arguments are the things that are given to the function to work on. Or the function needs these arguments to do something with. Otherwise, there is no point of a function if you don't have arguments because you, know, um, you don't know what to do with it. So you do something interesting with those arguments. Um, and that's the whole point of modularizing the code. That's why functions are there. Um, so functions can be passed as arguments to other functions. So you see here the arguments. This could be another function. So when you pass a function to the uh, to another function, that would be an example of nesting as well. So you're nesting one function within another function. Right? Uh, functions can be nested. So you can also define a function inside of another function. Uh, and the value of the function of the last expression is the, uh, uh, in the body to be evaluated. So the return argument is usually the uh, of a function is the last statement that was executed, and then that uh, the last argument is passed back as the value for a function. Um, that's how you get uh, stuff out of the function. Uh, so functions have named arguments, which are potentially the default values. The formal arguments are arguments included in the function definition. Um, so there are two kinds of arguments. There's the formal arguments, which are named. So you will say that data is equal to, so it needs data argument. It needs some other argument. You know, it could be whatever arguments you want to pass. And these are formal arguments, but um, not every function called an R makes use of formal arguments. So function arguments could be missing or might have default values. So this is an important concept to understand. Um, I'm pretty sure you would have had some doubts here in argument matching. Uh, so the way it works is that you know you have a function and you're passing and that function has certain arguments. For example, the standard deviation function has the, the x argument, which is your data, and then the na dot remove argument, which could be true or false. Now, when you are creating uh, using this other function r norm, you're just creating random normals uh, with value so 100 of them, and then you want to find the standard deviation. So one way is you just part my pass my data, and this my data is matched to the first argument, which is x. Um, but in that case, the default is stays the same. Whatever is the default for na.rm, if it was true as default, then that case, it stays the same. So all of these will return the same thing, essentially. Even if you change this, then as long as you have a named argument exclusively set, then 
that argument is taken out of the argument list and the first argument in the list of the function arguments is then matched to my data. So because you defined in or rm here, it will be removed from the argument list because its value is now defined. And then the next argument is my data, which happens to be the first argument of the standard deviation function, and therefore it gets assigned over there. Okay. Uh, so far, this is stuff that you've already done, so I'm just basically assuming that you know this. I'm just going over this very fast, because if there is any doubts you don't understand, please let me know and I will slow down and let you know what it is. How are we doing? Everybody on board so far? The ones with their arms folded, body language saying that you don't get it. <laughs> let me know. You don't need to change your body language, you can just ask. Them. <laughs> just let me know. Come on, speak up. This is why we're holding these classes, so that you get it. If you don't get it, it defeats the whole purpose. Come on. Nesting. Okay. You didn't get nesting. Yeah. All right. What about you? Did you, did you follow nesting? I, I get what nesting is trying to do, but I, by no means could I like, do it on my own or anything yet. Okay. So the reason why you probably won't be able to do it on your own yet is because you may need some practice. So if you start to you know, write some of those nested functions yourself or nested loops, you'll get it. Now, in regards to what is nesting, essentially think of it as calling something within itself. So basically, um, a loop is a group of statements that you want to execute um, you know, um, again and again, right? So the whole point of a loop is that it simplifies your number of lines that you have to write. So imagine printing every element of a matrix, right? So to print every element of a matrix, you have to basically say, uh, let's say it's a three by three matrix, three elements by three rows, three columns. You'll have to say print one one. So I assume x is the name of the matrix. So you print x one one, x one two, print x one three, print x two one, print x two two two, print x two three. Similarly, then print three one. So there are nine statements that you have to type to get the entire matrix printed. Now, is there a better way to do it? So the first thing you could do is how can we reduce this number of nine statements to a little less? One thing you can do is say for print uh, for um, i in 1 to the number of rows, do. And then print uh, x i, comma, so the, you've already set the rows now, x i, comma 1, x i, comma 2, x i, comma 3, right? So now you're printing it, you've reduced it from 9 to 3 statements just by using this for loop. So it's going to iterate for the number of rows, which is 1, 2, 3, and print x i, which will go from 1, 2, 3 to 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3. That's one way. Now, can we reduce it further to one statement? That's where nesting comes in. You have two for loops then, one for the number of rows, one for the number of columns, and you want to go first for the number of rows, then you go from one to the number of columns, and then you just have one statement, print x, i, j where j is the iterator variable for the number of columns, and i is the iterator variable for the number of rows. That's, that's, that's all nesting is. Right? And same thing with the functions. You define a function, and now within that function, you have to call some other function. For example, for uh, we just did that, basically, where we said, OK, in the for loop, we're calling, uh, so let's say we, instead of calling the for loop, we call a function. Uh, we'll, we'll actually cover that in a second when we study the apply, apply functions. They're essentially you're um, calling something on uh, a function on, say, the rows of a of a matrix. Now that function could call another function. So it could be that within that function, when you're applying it to the rows, you also want to call, say, the sum function for each element or print each element. So you can pass that function as an argument to the previous function. Okay. So that's all there is. It's really just a simply way to simplify. All of this stuff can be done explicitly by whatever you've learned without using any for loops, without using any other statements. You just have to type a lot of statements. If you're OK <coughs> typing statements, you never have to use a for loop. Except when you have to type a statement 1,000 times, then, then it becomes an issue. Then you start thinking that the value of using a function or a loop becomes important. All right? So for example, if you had to you know, paste a couple of things you know together or concatenate them you can actually do that by just using you know some uh, normal operations in R but the paste function actually lets you put so many arguments in one line and put them together and it just pastes it for you you don't have to worry about uh, what the paste function is calling within that it basically could be calling another function within itself to do that work for you 
right? Okay, so argument matching is a simple thing where you have these arguments. You understand what an argument is, right? Basically, those are the things that the function needs to perform its job, right? So these are the stuff that you are passing to the function to do stuff with. So these, for example, if this is a linear model function, this LM is a linear model, this helps you create a linear model, then this needs a few things. And those named arguments are it needs a formula, it needs data, it needs a subset, weights, na.action. We don't need to know what each of these are for now, but we need to know that these are arguments, and they have names that you have defined these arguments for these arguments. So the formula will be called formula as far as the function is concerned. You can assign this formula to something, and then that becomes the value of that argument in the function. The order has to be same. Like so that's is. the whole point of argument matching: is that you can actually, if you use the name, then the the order of the arguments can be changed. Highly recommend you don't do that because a lot of times it just becomes more complex. But that's what we're trying to show here: that that in order to run this, the first argument is formula, the next is data. But here, notice that if you assign this, this is the simple execution. So you have y tilde x, that's your formula. My data is your data argument. And then 1 comma 100 is your subset. And then model equal to false. Now, if we look just till here, the first three arguments match the first three arguments. But because we can also directly say data is equal to my data, then it doesn't matter whether you say this as the first argument or you put this in the end. As long as data is named, the order does not matter. But what happens is when you say data is equal to my data, it then comes out of the argument list and it is assigned it's done. The next thing then comes up. The next thing once data is gone is you look at formula and then you look at, whoa, formula, what's formula? That's what I need next. And if it does not, na it's not named, then the first argument that comes after will be assigned to formula. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, moving on. Uh, covered that, covered that. So just a few things. It checks for the exact name of the matched argument. So if you can, it also does partial matching. So if you, instead of you just saying formula is equal to data, you can say form is equal to data. It'll still assign formula as long as form does not is not appearing as an other argument in the later on. So if there's two forms, then there's an error. Otherwise, the, if there's just formula and form, you can just say form is equal to data. I wouldn't do that, it just confuses people, but just you can, you have the possibility. And it checks for positional matches, which is the default. It'll check the position and match the arguments. Okay, defining a function, we, you should basically know this. Uh, function is assigned to a variable f, and where you have three what do you have? What are A, B, and C, and D here? Arguments. There you go. <laughs> so A is the first argument. What is happening here? The, what are the defaults values for A, B, C, and D? Come on. Wake up, wake up. Come on. Anybody? No wrong answers. What is the default value for A? Come on. Zero. None. But good try. Good try. <laughs> a does not have a default. What's the default for B? Start right there. One. 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 Default for C. Two. Two. Default for null. No. Oh, D. D. <laughs> <laughs> Answer is given. Okay, so basically what it's saying here is if there is no value for B, C, and D, don't panic. You have the default values given. If you don't pass B, C, and D as arguments, that's fine. You could just call F of A and just give A some value. That still works because it takes the others as defaults. Okay? Do you understand this concept? So then that's why here. The other thing is something called as lazy evaluation, which means that it's not going to evaluate something until it's needed. So you can have two arguments with no defaults and just use one of them. It'll still give you the answer and throw no errors because B is never used. It does not care. As long as it's not being used, R does not care. It does not hold true for other languages. Java will expect you. It'll give you an error in other languages. Python and Java would probably give you an error, but R does not care. You don't use it. We're lazy. We don't care. Here. It'll still give you a print A, but then when it gets to print B, that's when the evaluation happens. It realizes, wait a second, there is no B. And it's the error. Okay? The dot, dot argument. One of the most widely used arguments in R, the dot, dot, dot. I think of it as the end, so it continues. <laughs> so basically, what it means is that you don't know how many arguments to pass. You don't know sometimes um, what arguments you need to pass to a function. For example, let's say you're concatenating the list. You have elements. But do you know how many elements in advance there are going to be? 
No, it depends on the runtime. When you're running a program, you could have 20 arguments, you could have 2,000 arguments. So therefore, you just when you're defining, but you need to define a function beforehand. You're writing the code before you execute the code. So therefore, you put dot, dot, dot. You say, I don't know yet, but there will be an unknown number of arguments here. So bear with me and keep that in mind and just execute this code until you get the arguments. So then you have paste as an example. What it does is it's a function It takes different things and just smooshes them together with a separator. All right? So by default, it says dot, 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 means you can have any number of elements to paste. The separator will be this blank space, and the collapse is null by default. Now, if you, same thing with cat, it takes dot, 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 any number of arguments, file is this, separator is this, and so on. Uh, arguments coming after the dot, dot, dot arguments need to be named explicitly and cannot be partially matched. So this is the catch here. You can give any number of arguments, but they have to be, uh, anything that comes after dot, 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 you cannot just say se equal to something and expect that to partially match. That's because you have an explicit number of arguments. If you don't say, sorry, you have an unknown number of arguments. If you don't explicitly say separator, it'll just assume set as another argument in the dot, dot, dot. Okay, which is why when you run this statement paste a b separator is equal to semicolon, you get a colon b. That's your separator for pasting these two things together. Paste is a very useful function. That's why we're using it as an example here. Does that make sense? Paste this statement. Don't look at his. Just look at this here. Paste a and b. You know, you have paste a and b, and separator colon. You get a colon b. Does that make sense so far? Paste is just pasting two things together. But here, when you say paste a and b in se is equal to semicolon, it uses the default separator, which is the blank space, and just creates a, a blank space b blank space semicolon. All right? Why did that happen? Come on. Why did this happen? I just mentioned it. Because you, it was not a partial match. Exactly, because we used se and not sep. So it's not going to do the partial matching here. All right? Because anything after dot, dot, dot in the function has to be matched explicitly. All right, that's the point. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, so now, these are the part which we covered today. So I'm going to slow down. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start with L apply, S apply, apply, T apply, and apply. These are very important functions. Uh, you can also use the function split, particularly with L apply, but we're not going to cover that. You can watch the video for that on your own. We're going to try to cover these. Uh, L apply loops over a list to evaluate a function in each element. Simple. List apply. Think of it like that. It takes a list, it takes a function, it applies the function to every element of the list. How simple is that? Easy. Now you, you can ask me why can I not just do it in a for loop? Of course you can. You can do any of these things in a for loop and the common conception or misconception shall I say that these loops are faster than for loops or any other loops is not true anymore. It used to be. Uh, they have optimized the code for all of these functions now, so for loop works just as fast as this. The only reason why you're learning this is because computer scientists are lazy, and they want to run everything in one line, as opposed to writing five lines for it. That's the only reason why we're doing this. Except there, it does, for some of the things though, you can't do them with a for loop or it'll take too many lines. But basically the reason is that we're lazy, we want to do everything in one line. Okay? S apply is the same as, as S apply, uh, L apply, but it tries to simplify the result. You might ask, what is simplify? And I will tell you that we'll cover that in a second. Okay. T apply, it applies a function to the margins of an array. So if you want to apply a function to the rows of an array, or to the columns of an array, but not to the rows. So supposing you want to apply something just to the columns. You want column sums for each of the elements, uh, for a matrix. Uh, that's where you use an apply function. But, you know, in this case, it just explicitly, you have to specify what you want. But we'll go over that. T apply. In my opinion, it should be V apply. And that's not because Vishal starts with a V. <laughs> I just think that T apply should be V apply because it's, it's about a vector. And there is no T in any of these other things that it works on. It's basically the sum of function is really simple. You apply a function to a subset of a vector. So you have a vector. You want to apply something to, say, the first 10 elements. Say it's a 100 element vector. You want to apply some one function to the first 10 and another something to, uh, uh, to the other 10, right? That's where you use to apply. Or you want to apply the same function, but you only want to apply it to the first 
one kind of element. So the first 10 elements are of a kind, right? So then you use t apply. Does that make sense? So for example, let's say you have the, the ages of men and, and the ages of women. You want to find the average age of, uh, of a cancer patient or in pancreatic cancer. So what is the age, average age? And you have the list of ages for men who had pancreatic cancer, and you have the list of ages for women who had pancreatic cancer. Now, you just, that's just a vector. Now, you can apply the t-apply function by saying that, you know, I want, there are two different kinds of factors here, men and women. Uh, that vector, second vector, would be the same length as the first vector, which is the ages, except it will just contain the first 50 elements, or say there are 100, first 50 women, next 50 men. So the same way for that vector, there'll be 50, just say women, 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 or www, and another 50 mmm. That's the fact factor vector. And then you apply, based on that, you just say the function mean, or average mean. And it will give you the mean age for women and mean age for men. That's your output for t apply. Okay, that's how it works. We'll show you in a second. Uh, m apply is a multivariate version of l apply. It can be used basically, l apply takes only one list as an argument. Supposing you want to apply one function, but you want to apply it at the same time to two lists. Right? So m apply helps you do that. Okay? So m apply is a multivariate version of l apply. So l apply basically if we go over is a list, loops over lists to evaluate a function in each element. Now supposing you have two lists and you want to apply a function on arguments of both lists at the same time. So that way you cannot do that with L apply. Again, you can write a simple loop <laughs> that goes for I in list one, list two, apply the function and then it would work. But M apply does that for you. It just says that you just give it a function and the lists that you want to apply the function to and it applies it. Okay. So far so good. Everybody on board with just the definition part, not the the evaluation of what the function does. Okay, so let's start with the simplest of the applies, the lapply function. The lapply takes three arguments, um, a list, a function, a list x, that's the default name for that, a function, or the name of the function, which is called fun, because this is fun for us, <laughs> or it's, at least it's supposed to be, <laughs> so we'll pretend it is. The other arguments via dot, dot, dot arguments. So anything else that you want to pass to the function, you just put dot, 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 and those arguments go directly to the function. Does that make sense? That's why we need dot, 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 because we don't know what function is going to be the function, and therefore we don't know the number of arguments for that function, and so you put dot, dot, dot when we define L apply. Does that make a little sense in terms of why we need dot, dot, dot? Like, it'll become clear as we go along, but that's why, right? So because L apply itself is a function, which now we want to call another function within that, but now we don't know what function this is going to be. Therefore, we do not know how many arguments this function fun will have. Therefore, for L apply as a function, we'll have to put dot, dot, dot. How's that going? But I totally don't get the dot, dot, dot. Okay, dot, dot, dot just means that we don't know. But what's the point of you putting it then? <laughs> well, it means so that we don't... Does it space somewhere for our well, argument? Right, that, and it gives you the flexibility of having multiple arguments being passed to a function when you don't know what function you're going to be applied to. For example, let's take a simple example. You have a matrix, right? Now, you want to apply the one function you can apply is I want to find the sum. And you want to apply it to, um, or, or say you have lists. Each list contains vectors. Sorry, forget the matrix. List, because we're doing L apply. L apply takes lists. So that list, remember lists? Does anybody remember? Can you tell me what a list is? It can be like a number, numeric, uh, character, logic. Right, like but it can have multiple elements, and each element can have whatever it, it, it can contain, numeric or logical or anything, yeah. right? So let's assume it's a list of vectors. So a list containing multiple vectors is there. Now, one function you can pass is uh, mean. You want to find the mean of each vector in that list. Does that make sense? So now, what are the arguments of mean? It's just a vector, a list of numbers, right? Right? So that here you can say x is your list, which would we'll contain, and it'll contain all the vectors. Now, 
the function that we're calling is a mean. Now mean takes only one argument, so it's very simple. You just pass the vector v and we're done. So if they had, instead of dot, 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 they could have just put v here in, and that would be the vector v. Right? But in that case, this function would only be able to take one argument, which is the vector. Right? Are you defining a new function? So. So in your example, yes. if we were to do mean, the function would be mean. Yes. OK. So in this case, we're defining a new function, fun, that we're going to pass. Fun is basically going to be assigned to mean. OK. So right now, we're defining that function, which we'll pass the L of pi. Right, so let's look at the example, and that should clarify certain things for the plan. So x is a list where it contains one element A, which is a matrix, two by two matrix, okay? And then another element B, which is also a matrix, which is a three by two matrix, okay? Is that clear? One, two, three, and then, oh, sorry, one, two, three, four <coughs> is the first matrix, four elements, two rows, two columns, and then the second matrix is uh, three rows, one, two, uh, and then two columns, so one, six, two, five, three, six. Okay, so far so good. So what's the dollar sign? <laughs> okay, who will tell me what that dollar sign is? That means that's the data in that particular slot. For right. That, right, so because we named this argument as A equal to matrix this, this is the name of that matrix which you can access by X dollar A. Otherwise, you would have had to go double brackets uh, one to get the first element. All right? Go over the previous videos, and you will understand that this is when we're naming lists, and when we're naming them, we uh, we use this convention if it is named here. Otherwise, there's the other way to access this would be to have two brackets in front of x, and then one would be the first element, which would be this. Okay? All right, so now let's L apply on X the function ELT, right? Where we're defining this function ELT right in front of it by saying ELT is just return the comma one, which is the first column. So in this statement, let's just first focus on two things. The first one is that we have defined a function here within apply, while calling apply, you've just defined a function. That whole thing by itself is a concept to understand. It is called an anonymous function because this function does not have a name. It's anonymous. It will only exist within the context of this L apply statement. Therefore, we have not assigned it a name. Okay? We just said function ELT which takes an argument ELT, and that ELT, comma one, is returned back. Notice all of that is like one, two, 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 uh, you know, parts. The function ELT, and then ELT, comma one, is the return statement right there, the next thing. So that's if you're creating a new function, but if you were just doing mean, you would just say X, comma, mean. Yes, okay. exactly. That would be the easiest, simplest case. Yes, but then for mean, you have to pass arguments. Mean parentheses right. stuff. Stuff, exactly. So here, when you're saying ELT comma one, and that's what you want to do to each element <coughs> that you are getting from X. So each element in the first case, ELT one, uh, ELT would be dollar A, which is the first element, and the second, uh, when it runs for the second element, that'll turn to B. So that's why you get the first column of A, and then the first column of B. As your output. Sorry, what is what is the ELT? Like? Oh, that's just uh, we're calling it ELT. You could call it Vishal. Okay. <laughs> you could call it function Vishal uh, in parentheses and then Vishal comma one. That's the name of the argument that you're passing inside. Okay. You could call it Y. You just can't call it X here because X is your list. But you can call it Y function Y. So all you're saying is this function takes an argument y, or ELT, and then within that, you're defining the return value y of comma 1, which is that return the first value, which is the column, first column. Right? That's it. Okay. 
So can I can I go back to one thing? So in the function, you say function, you're defining what the input is, and that last part is what the output of the function should yes, be. Yes, the last statement that is evaluated. In, yes. Okay. This is the smallest way of writing a function. It's like function, brackets, what you pass to the function, and there's only one thing what you're doing is returning from the function. The dot 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 is only when you're creating your own function. Yes, or you're passing a function for which the arguments you don't know. The dot 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 just means that we don't know what the arguments will be. It's a tough concept to understand in this world of computer science where everything is defined. There are things that are not defined, that like you're not certain of. So there is the, the way to get at this concept is the runtime versus interpreter or compile time. So when you're compiling stuff, all you need to know for the compiler needs to know is that something will happen. So it needs to be prepared for that, right? It's like people who are buying doomsday bunkers, right? They don't know that doomsday is coming, but they're still preparing for it by just, you know, investing some money in like this $1.2 million home that they're buying in Utah, middle of, you know, Montana somewhere, you know? That's exactly what's <laughs> happening here. So basically you're saying that the computer is allocating memory in, in you know, processing power for something. So it's yes. just making sure there's some set right. aside. Right. We're saying something will happen. We just don't know what will happen. It could be an earthquake. It could be a meteor fall shower that will kill everyone. It could be dinosaurs coming back to life in Jurassic Park. <laughs> but we got to get our bunker ready. So dot, dot, dot is just that. It's like, get your bunker. What happens if you don't put dot, dot, dot? Uh, it'll fail because it doesn't. It will just be like, I don't know what you. Why, why are you passing me this other argument? What does this function? I don't know what to do with it. Like you, then you are defining stuff. You are saying that doomsday will happen, and that's because uh, this comet Zeli will contact Earth and crash into it at twenty fifth, uh, tw twenty uh, whatever, twenty thirty time, ten a.m. And that's the only time it'll happen. It cannot happen any other time, day, and that'll be the only comet that'll ha come and collide. You know what I'm saying? You kind of lost me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you're, well, so you're defining stuff. It's very definitive. When you define a function and it's very definitive, you are sure that these are the elements that will be happening in this function that will be used. So mean for two numbers, you define, like, we, this mean will only be for two numbers. So you define a new function called mean two numbers. And you say this mean two numbers will take one argument a, which is an integer, another argument b, which is an integer, and all it will do is calculate the mean of a and b. Now that's a defined definitive function, right? But supposing now you want next time you get, say, three elements, right? And you're saying that, oh, now I have three elements. I cannot call mean two numbers. Right? So, because if you say, if you pass a third number, the function mean two numbers does not know what to do with the third number. It's just going to throw an error. Saying that, you know, how can I, and you say mean a comma b comma c, mean two numbers a comma b comma c. Let me explain that. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, okay, maybe we, I'll ask you later. I'll okay, does everybody else get the concept? A little bit, Nicole. You're very quiet. Yeah, I mean, I this again is something I think that if I work through, I'll figure it out. But okay, all right. Uh, I can't move on. I have to explain this to people. <laughs> I mean, all right, all right. Let's. Uh, I'm gonna quickly pause my quick time for this. Sorry, everybody. No. No, no. Actually, quick time wasn't even running, so. <laughs> All right, so this is fine. Let's uh, turn on the display for a second. Let's go over here. So, all right, so let's say we are uh, defining a function. Mean two numbers. I mean, you, you get the point, right? So, mean two numbers is a function of which takes a comma b and then you say this is the return mean of a comma b now you've just defined a mean two numbers function okay isn't that how you define a function right does that make sense all right now when we call this mean two numbers function 
let's say we're trying to call this function here, right? So what we're going to do is, let's say a is assigned 1, b is assigned 2, um, and so we call mean two numbers of a comma b. What will this do? Or let's say this is x, just to make things simpler. I don't want to use the same names. Just to make it simpler, I'm calling x and y. And here, we pass x and y. Now tell me first what happens. Anybody? Or in fact, rather than using mean function within here, let's make it even simpler. We say uh, c is equal to a plus b divided by 2, because we know there are two arguments here. Right? And then we say c, and that's your function. Basically, what we just did is we calculated the mean of two numbers, a plus b divided by 2, and then the next statement c is returning the output. Okay? And we assign this function to mean two numbers. That's what we've done. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, x and y are two numbers, and we're calling mean two numbers. What will happen? Take the mean. It will basically substitute the value of x to a, y to b, and then it will calculate c is equal to 1 plus 2 divided by 2, which is? Thank you. So, and then the next thing that will be printed out on the console would be 1.5. That's your output. Right? That's what it will return. Okay, so far everyone's with me. Right. Now, how about we have another element, a variable here, z, defined as 3. And I call x, y, z. What will happen now? No error. Yeah. Will it just get the same result? Actually, in this case, it will give the same result. Uh, because you, even though you assign z, it's like that b thing. So it will still give you 1.5. Right? In this case, it didn't give you an error because you're only using a and b, but it'll just use a and b and not give you anything with the 3. How but did it know that to pick x and y as a and b as opposed to picking z as one of a and b? Well, because it's the lazy loading concept that I was trying to explain earlier. So you're, it loads it lazily. Unless the z is explicitly called here, there is no other element, uh, you know, d here. You but if it? you had written mean two numbers and then put... Actually, you know what? It, it, it'll give you an error. Sorry, I take that back. Because the, it, it will give you an error. I'm sorry. The reason it will give you an error is because there is no function that is defined which takes three arguments here. And those three arguments have been defined here as x, y, and z, but this function only takes two arguments, a and b. So this function will not, does not exist. So how are you going to find the mean of that? So then you have to define a new function mean three numbers, which will take another argument, let's call it d, and then this c is a plus d divided by, now you have to change the function, 3. Right? So where does the dot 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 come in then? That's exactly what I'm getting to. It seems to me that you just have to be able to construct your function. Right. Now you can either so keep doing so this, specific. you can either keep doing this, right? Or you can just define a simple function called mean, where you can just say, I don't know the number of arguments that are you going to pass. Dot dot dot. Okay? So you can pass me any number of arguments. What I'll do is basically, I'm going to get the count of the number of arguments. So depending on the number of arguments, I'll get a count of the number of arguments. And then based on the number of arguments, I will take the number of arguments. I will sum those and then divide by the number of arguments. And that's my mean. Okay. All right. So if, if you look at the actual uh, definition of, you look at the actual definition of the mean function, So, here. 
So mean in this case it takes the uh, here it takes one element x which is an object of uh, of the, for which you want to calculate the mean. But then there is a the dot 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 which means that these are the further arguments to be passed to or from other methods. Uh -huh. So but what if you want x y z like you were saying? Yeah, well in this case you construct x y z as mean of zero colon ten, um, you know, comma fifty which is a second argument. Uh, Sorry, so it's x 0, 10 and then 50, this is x and then xm is mean of x. So here it just basically took one, um, you know, those x and then it just counted the number of elements and divided it by the number of elements with the sum of the elements. Alright? Let's explain this a little bit more with um, apply. So apply is a function, right, that we're trying to write, right? And within that we want to calculate actually comes up a little further. Uh, a good example comes up right here. Uh, a good example comes up under... So... So, uh, to explain this concept of dot, 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 let's just go over t apply, which we have to cover anyways, so it'll be actually make things easier. Now, t apply is used to apply a function over a subset of vectors. Uh, again, I don't know why it's called t apply, I covered that. Uh, now, if you see the definition of t apply, it takes x, which is uh, a vector, and index, which is a list of factors, or something that will be coerced to factors, and a function fun, which is to be applied to that uh, based on the list, or and the dot 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 contains other arguments that are passed to the function. Okay, now um, and simplify as should we simplify the results or not, and we'll cover that in a second. Now let's see what happens in, with an example. So let's say we contain this vector. Uh, we co create this vector uh, of ten random normals and tell ten uniform values and another ten random normals. Okay, so then. We want to call, well, then we create this f as a factor, which basically is uh, repeating 1 10 times, 2 10 times, and 3 10 times. So we're creating a factor of, you know, three different types. So 1, 2, and 3 are the actual uh, levels of the factor. Um, so 1, 2, and 3 are the levels, and then the remaining is just the uh, number. So the other equivalent was what I gave you, like, you know, your men and women. So men and women are the levels, but you have... 50 data points for men, 50 data points for women, and you want to find the average of this. So here, that's what we're doing, t apply x comma f comma mean. So here, 1, 2, and 3 are your uh, values of, of, of the levels. So the mean of 1 is this. So the first 10 values, which are normal, the mean of that is this. The mean of the uniform values is this, and the mean of the remaining three level 3, um, the type 3, is this. Now, supposing now we want to calculate the range instead of calculating the, the mean. So now, range is, again it doesn't cover the dot dot dot, but anyways, but in this case you have one, two or two outputs instead of one. You don't, you're not calling the mean, you're calling the range. Now range internally takes different arguments than mean. Right? In this case, it's the same. You're taking the same list. It's x as a vector. But it could happen that supposing you have you have, you want to specify another thing for for the range. So let's say for range, uh, another argument could be you know our let's redefine range as a function that calculates not just the the smallest and the largest, but also gives you the mean. Let's just say for example. Then you could say range, and then uh, within that, and say you want to specify the range with including another uh, a fourth value. So 50 is that value. You can pass that value here next to range by saying 50 and then that 50 goes into the range function as its argument. Does that make any sense? Or any number? No. The part got confusing. I lost that. Okay. All right. So 
what we're what we're saying here <coughs> is again. Where is that? function you will call it as fun one over let's say vec vector one is your vector of elements one to ten okay so you call this function fun one with vector one and that's that you get your mean so this will return you the essentially means tell me the mean of one to ten all right so far so good now, within this function, right, right. So now, let us say that we want to add another function within this, which takes some other arguments. So let us say paste of x, comma, dot, dot, dot. Okay. Alright. So now. Alright. So now what, what will happen? What I've right, done right here is I'm saying if there are additional arguments here, the first argument of vectors x will just calculate the mean of. Okay. So far so good. The next thing we'll do, we'll take the, the elements of x and we'll use the default paste functionality and we'll paste them together. So you will probably get one comma, say one, then you get one, two, three, four, each with a blank space like that, till 10, and that's your output. And if there's anything else that is passed here, it'll get passed here and paste it along with it, okay? So we don't know what that is. So now, if I'm calling this, one thing I can do is I can call call vector one, and this will just give me one, two, one to three, four, paste it together as output. So let's say we call here vector one uh, x, where sorry, uh, sorry, vector one is a vector. Sorry, uh, we pass that as an argument to our function fun one, right? So now, because we've redefined it with two things, what would be the output? One would be, of course, the mean for now, with just this one argument. It would be the mean of that, which would be, what, are, what is the mean of one to 10? Let's just make it simple. Let's just call it one, two, three. So what's the mean of one, two, three if x is, if x contains, oh sorry, if vec, vector one, is essentially uh, 1 colon 3. So what is the mean of 1 to 3? 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 3 is 6, 6 divided by 3 is 2, therefore the value of this function first thing would be mean which would be 2. And then the second output would be the paste function which is 1 space 2 space 3. Right? I'm using space here, not, it's not an underscore, it's a blank space. Okay? So that's one. Now, <clears throat> supposing we want to call the function one with vector one, but we also want to add, we just decide that we want to calculate, uh, uh, we want to add five or four colon, four colon five or four colon six. So that's four, five, six to this argument list. Because we've added dot, dot, dot here, if there were no dot, 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 this would immediately throw an error. 
right? But because we have comma dot dot dot, which means it accepts other arguments, it will go ahead and execute this. First, it will take x and it will calculate the mean of x, which is vector one. And then the remaining arguments, four, five, six, it will pass to paste, which then takes x, which is vector one. So one, two, three. But it also takes four, five, six, and takes four, five, six, and displays them as well. Now, you didn't have to explicitly change anything or do anything. Just by doing dot, 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 you were able to avoid an error and use this function in a different way. Does that make sense? OK, good. <laughs> All right. So that's why we need dot, dot, dot. <laughs> That's just one of the things. I mean, it can be used for other things, but for now. We're really behind, but we're going to go slow so that you understand everything. So we're clear about one thing, right? Now we've covered t-apply. Does anybody have questions about t-apply? Right? We got t-apply. Everybody got that? OK, so we have a few other applies left. Let's just go over. S apply and M apply, and then we'll be ready for our practical. Okay. Alright, so S apply. still have apply as well. Okay, so we covered this. So S apply will simply fire the result of L apply if possible. So what that means is that if the result, uh, so you know L apply returns a list. We just know that. So if result is a list where, a list where every element is of length one, then a vector is returned. So instead of returning a list, if every element of the, uh, the resulting list is of length one, it transforms that to a vector. If the result is a list, where every element is a vector of the same length, it makes that into a matrix. Otherwise, if you can't figure things out, it just returns a list. That's all there is to it between S apply and L apply. Okay? Now let's go to apply. So apply is used to evaluate a function, which is often an anonymous one, which we just showed earlier, uh, over the margins of an array. It is most often used to apply a function over the rows or columns of a matrix. So the input is. Uh, you know, it can be used with any kind of array, so any general generic arrays, taking advantage of the array dimensions. So whether you want to apply to the, you know, uh, whatever dimension of the array you want to apply something to, and it's uh, it's not really faster than writing a loop as we discussed, but it works in one line. So for example, uh, here you have a random normal of a matrix with uh, 20 rows and 10 columns, and you want to apply x on apply, on, sorry, on x, the matrix, you want to apply for each column. So one is for row, two is for columns. You want to apply that and find the mean of each column. So this is what you get. And if you wanted to find the sum or mean of each row, then the second way would be to just go apply one comma that. All right? So far, so good. OK. Uh, same thing, call row, call sums are essentially applies. So if you have used call rows and call sums, they can be written as apply, where you're finding the row means, same thing. T apply covered. Uh, M apply. So M apply, apply is a multivariate apply of sorts in which uh, function uh, it applies a function in parallel over a set of arguments. So uh, here, the first argument is the function that you want to apply. So this is mostly used when you have multiple lists but you want to apply one function on different elements of that list in parallel, okay, at the same time. So, so here dot 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 contains the arguments to apply over again. Now we don't know the number of lists here. So right, in L apply we know the number of lists is one list. In M apply we don't know how many lists are going to be there on which we need to apply this function to. Therefore dot 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 makes sense to put here. This will be defined when the user is the one who is defining you know, how many lists they want to enter. 
and more arguments is a list of other arguments to functions um, and simplify indicates whether you want to simplify the results so as usual simplify we just covered in s apply what we're doing so that simplification of the results uh, so m apply so for example the repeat function is something which takes two arguments the on the repeat function take uh, two arguments the first one is one to four which is the elements that you want repeated and the second is the number of times you want them repeated and so the first argument and then basically apply that and create a list output and that is essentially one four times one four times uh, two three times three twice and four once okay okay now, there was an assignment that I wanted you to do so given that noise this is the noise function so let's move over to the practical uh, we're gonna try to first solve this using m apply since we just covered this so let's say we define a noise function where uh, this function takes one argument n takes the mean and the standard deviation and the, out, the output is the random norm with n as the, uh, the element so say 5 mean is based on the mean value here and standard deviation of this so you're basically changing the random normal function you define the mean and so basically now a noise of 5 1 2 has a mean of 1 so you have 5 outputs generated, five random normal outputs generated which have the mean of one and standard deviation of two. All right, now, is that first of all, is the function clear? This function is, is a definitive function, it takes three values, n is the number of elements, mean is the mean that you want for that number of elements, and standard deviation is the standard deviation that you want for those elements when you create a random norm. And you, all you do is call the random norm function within that. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, so, for example, noise of 512 is this. Now, using an apply, write the command to create a list of one random normal with mean 1, two random normals with mean 2, three random normals with mean 3, till five random normals with mean 5. The standard deviation can stay at 2. All right, you have five minutes. We'll take a five minute break, and then we'll start the practical. <laughs> this is your assignment to complete using mApply in the next, you know, five minutes. <laughs>